<clears throat> Hello. Um, today we'll talk about uh, an intriguing um, North American architect. It seems it is his birthday today. Um, it depends if the source of my uh, knowledge um, is, uh, is uh, correct. So, Mark Forster Gage, a man who is uh, intensely uh, uh, attempting to uh, irritate us with a kind of architecture we thought would never be possible again, or never be possible, period. This is the, the cover of a book uh, on him, and maybe by him. I don't know the book. I don't have it. I didn't have it. Mark Foster Gage, Projects and Provocations. Uh, architects usually do projects, but in the field of provocations, very few uh, dare to venture. Anyway, on this cover, we see on the right a tower that uh, Mark Foster Gage proposed for Manhattan, uh, New York City, and uh, far away, we see Empire State Building, as if some kind of a dialogue was meant between the two buildings. Uh, the Empire State Building with a solitary man, at least uh, how he is depicted on that uh, balcony, staring towards uh, the famous uh, old tower, the Empire State Building under a huge sky. Here is the man looking a little bit like uh, Vincent van Gogh. Um, it's possible I'm not the only one who, who, who said something like this. Um, and uh, here he is at uh, Ted's, Ted's uh, talks, you know, he, uh, he had to be invited, of course, because he, he has a vision. Now, if we agree with his vision or not, this is another, another issue, but he does have a vision, which is itself uh, quite provocative. Let's look at this outfit for Lady Gaga. I forgot to say that uh, Mark Foster Gage teaches at Yale University, which uh, is uh, kind of a surprising considering the, you know, the outrageous aspects of his work. Uh, yeah, let's look at this outfit for Lady Gaga. Uh, well, he did all kinds of things, some of them having to do with architecture, some of them having to do with sculpture, some of them having to do with, uh, you know, installations of various sorts. So obviously he liked Lady Gaga, and I, I like Lady Gaga too. I even launched a competition some years ago, a house for Lady Gaga. Uh, I even launched one, one called a house for not Lady Gaga. Uh, but uh, obliquely uh, still relating to uh, to Lady Gaga. We see that uh, Mark Foster Gage uh, himself uh, seems to be preoccupied by this, uh, uh, you know, very interesting, in my opinion, singer, actress, and so on, with, a, with a, an astute, uh, an intense sense of, uh, of theatre. And I think the, the Baroque, the theater are uh, uh, explicitly related to the work of Mark, Mark Foster Gage. The persona of Lady Gaga also is possible that attracted his attention. House on Il René Le Vasseur, I don't know where this is, maybe in France or maybe in Canada. This is a, a kind of architecture that uh, most uh, schools of architecture and most architects would, would completely uh, love to hate. I mean, you know, what happened to our civilization of asphalt? Where is the car? Where is the belief in um, righteousness and the right angle? And uh, uh, where is the, the conviction that uh, we can defeat any kind of damaging uh, 
effects of nature on our buildings. Thus, ruins will not exist any longer. Well, look at Mark, Mark Foster Gage, what he envisioned here. Uh, in a primeval forest, of course. It does take, take courage, in my opinion, to make such proposals. And this is the interior. But it's obvious it's not the most modest house in the world. If it, it, if it would have been built, it would not have been one of the most modest. But, but this is not the point. This is not what Mark Foster Gage was looking for towards or for, you know, to make a modest house. Is it sustainable? Of course it is not sustainable. But it is a house which explores other aspects of human life and human history, and maybe even human uh, uh, anxiety or human uh, desire to, uh, you know, envision uh, Horizons of hope when no hope is, you know, possible. I don't know what to think about that uh, huge table there with, uh, I didn't count the chairs, but uh, the, there seem to be at least uh, 11 chairs. Let me count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can't. We have 13, maybe 12 plus one. Um, it's some kind of a man-made uh, cave. Nicola Formichetti store in Tokyo and Sao Paulo. Now, again, those who think that ornament died uh, should think twice. Because it obviously didn't die. And not just because Mark Poster Gage in, indulges himself into these kind of things. But other people do the same. Uh, maybe not as uh, intensely uh, as he does, but there are others who do. Plus, there is also some kind of a strange mixture here between uh, psychedelia and, uh, you know, a uh, bizarre world of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of a cartoonish or Disney uh, uh, phantasmagoria. Uh, But what exactly here is the relationship between Michelangelo and uh, Mark Foster Gage, I do not know. Apparently, there must be. Otherwise, he would, he would not have played the famous uh, work by Michelangelo here in, uh, in uh, conjunction with, uh, with what, he, what he made there. Mignon, Yale Seminary Research, Seminar Research. Well, that's the work he did or does with his students at Yale and uh, 3D printed as they are. Here I see some echoes of uh, that uh, entry of Gaetano Pesce uh, for the Chicago Tribune competition. The machine working hard to please Mr. Gage. And uh, yeah, why not? Why not, uh, you know, insist on, on uh, engaging the machine to um, realize our dreams or nightmares? Here are the students who helped Mr. Gage, uh, you know, with uh, the intervention of the robot also to create these things. Obviously, they are enjoying themselves, aren't they?
Now we arrive at his most outrageous uh, project, as far as I know, the Helsinki Guggenheim Museum. And that's how I actually learned about uh, Mr. Gage, because uh, what he proposed is, um, is unacceptable, actually. Here it is, the museum on the right. But I'm sure that if it was built, everybody would have gone to Helsinki to see it. It's horrible. It's unacceptable. It's terrible. It's, uh, it's, it's simply not, 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 not possible to do something like this. And yet he did. And that's exactly why I find the work uh, that, you know, we cannot ignore it. Uh, I don't know if he, I'm not even sure. I mean, I know this is part of the elevation of the, of the museum. And I don't know what this is, you know, with all those colors and all those animals and it's, what was in his mind when he did this? But then what is a museum? You know, a museum is some kind of a, a repository, some kind of a, you know, art depot and not home depot. This is the plan. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> and the section. So who said that symmetry is gone? It's not. Who said the sculpture in uh, adorning architecture is gone? It is not. Uh, so everything uh, orthodox uh, modernity stood against is coming back in the work of Mark Foster Gage and not just in his work. There are other architects who, you know, maybe not so radically, but, uh, you know, move in, in, in the same direction. Uh, yes. And now with the help of the artificial intelligence, some interesting proposals in this sense came into being. I could have never done something like this, I confess. But I, I cannot ignore it. Nicola Formichetti's story. In New York City, Mark Foster Gage, who clearly has a, has a psychedelic uh, uh, state of mind. He likes to confuse us, to overwhelm us, to create uh, ambiguous circumstances, reflections, reflections and reflections again, and colors and uh, fragmentation and uh, the dissolution of, the, of, of, of reason in a way. I, I don't even know what I'm looking at. He's dreaming, but he's also acting. And we need people like him, you know, to take us outside of the comfortable, uh, secure little box we are trapped in. Automotive, automotive display facility. And now, <laughs> this is not what you, you might have had in mind when you, this is not what you might have had in mind when you, when you, when, when one read, you know, such a, such a uh, title. Let's read it again because I cannot memorize it. Auto, automat, au, automotive, automotive display facility. So it's some kind of a, museum, I guess, or some kind of a showroom, vertical showroom of cars. But 
the architecture is, is totally uh, uh, surprising because that's not how you envision a showroom of cars. And uh, it's it's a monument. It's 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 an uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, you know it's more than a monument. It's a hyper monument. It's the monument of monuments. And in a way, I mean, I don't know if he intended to be sarcastic, but <laughs> you know, its Majesty the car does deserve, in a way, uh, uh, both sarcasm and the way and. and and, and, and his structure, his building, uh, I guess, wants to convey this. Uh, it's, 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 it's a kind of architecture you certainly would not uh, associate with a car. Although, although Kengo Kuma himself, at the beginning of 1990s, did make a showroom for Mazda, which had elements of uh, history, if we consider the giant column I guess a, a, a Doric column, I mean, giant, probably the, the biggest, well, it's a, only a fragment, but he built it, Kengo Kuma. And now that, this is also interesting that that showroom that Kengo Kuma designed and built in Tokyo is now a funeral home. And this aspect can be seen even here. Somehow in these monuments, even for such a function, uh, a showroom for cars does have a, some kind of a connection with death. So uh, you see it here as well. You know, th this space, this room would have made one think of, uh, of, of something uh, funeral. And, and, and the building, what can we say? It's, it's gloriously moving upwards towards an empty sky. Uh, it's possible he was sarcastic or I don't know, but uh, it's worth thinking about what the car means in the world and in our lives and to think about his project, the vertical automotive display facility, as he called it. <laughs> this project would have infuriated many professors and teachers and instructors and assistants who would have, who'd have had you know, potentially to evaluate the work if it was, if it was presented by a, a you know, a, an unacceptable student, uh, you know, uh, at one point in his adventurous career in the school. But here we are not having a student who did this, but a professor and at what university? Yale University in the United States. I cannot read the first word, but I can read the next two, concert hall. Uh, does it look like a concert hall? No. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, how, how the work is unveiled after passing through the primeval forest. So it's almost like it is in a stage, you know, the curtains open up and then, you know, the, the forbidden fruit is shown. The architectural one. Of course, these are just projects, but they do show a certain sensibility and a certain personality that is uh, uh, unsettling us. And he's a man of great passion. I, I mentioned uh, the, the, the dialogue he had with uh, Patrick Schumacher, of all people, uh, I think at the university in Texas, and it can be found on YouTube. And it's a beautiful, uh, polemical, highly charged dialogue between two architects who mean it, both of them, both Mark Foster Gage and Patrick Schumacher. And that kind of intensity and, and devotion, I, I would like to see uh, more often. So he is an interesting man. Uh, beyond the question if you accept his proposals or not, his architecture or not. Metropole Hotel. Look at this. <laughs> Unacceptable again. But then why not? Why would, why would the building on the left and the building on the right be more acceptable? Why? 
But it is infuriating, yes, and again and again. Who would say that? Who would say any longer that ornament is dead? It's not dead at all. In fact, it's quite assertive and, uh, uh, you know, uh, bothering us with its uh, assertiveness. Otherwise, the plan of the of the hotel is, you know, rather predictable. No, it's a hotel. Some rooms on a corridor, left and right. But the expression of the building, and again and again, the, what distinguishes it alarmingly is is the ornament. The National Center for Science and Innovation of Lithuania. Wow. <laughs> You know, who said that monumentality is dead? It's not. Who said that ornament is dead? It's not. Who said that symmetry is dead? It's not. And yes, yes, of course, this is not what we would expect at a time of sustainability. This is not a so-called so sustainable building. But it could be seen as sustainable in the sense that to erect such a building, you would need a lot of people who would give up soap operas and their TVs and their bonanza shows on TV, you know, whatever medium and labor to erect this structure, these buildings day and night, day and night, day and night. So he doesn't propose just another architecture which is not actually divorced from a certain past, but he's also proposing a different modus vivendi, because in order to build these buildings, you need to live a different life, I would say. Is it a quest for God or for the infinite or for, for the absolute? I'm not sure, but, but, but they do quest for something else than the gods of our present time. It seems so. Maybe they did some quest for eternity, for a certain kind of eternity, if we can say something so questionable. What does it mean, a certain kind of eternity? Eternity is eternity. That's it. Just as like Louis Kahn said, order is. Eternity is. You cannot say a certain kind of eternity. But I'm not very sure, you know, based on what, on what kind of cosmos of hope that religion was supposed to give the humans, uh, Mark Foster Gage is basing, basing uh, you know, his uh, attitude vis-a-vis -vis architecture on. I don't know. But I, I still think his proposals cannot be ignored. And, uh, you know, in a world obsessed by thinness, by the glass mythology, by the, uh, the asphalt of the highways, that by the speed of the cars, electrical or otherwise, here comes a man who proposes a kind of architecture that, that uh, is uh, also not quite democratic. It's, it's rather an architecture of some uh, longings uh, outside of the realm of democracy and uh, with a certain heroic weight that uh, you would not associate with, uh, you know, uh, uh, high-end uh, capitalism or high-end democracy. No. Here is, it is about something else a different kind of human being, a different kind of human society would build these, these, uh, these structures. And I, I'm not sure that someone who wants to go to Mars would build something like this on Earth. House in a field, a Harvard project, this was done with his students. So it's the work of his students, but under his direction. So let's uh, read a little bit. Surface complexity, layer depth, and rich materiality provide an alternative to blankness or monolithic. Here, ornamental agency claims the space itself, every single wall, floor, and ceiling. 
spatial ornamentation fosters intimate rather than indifferent engagement with the home through controlled articulation, drawing one into the visual sensuousness of its unfolding depths. House in a field is a series of insertions as vertically strag staggered living spaces catalyzed by visual richness, prompting the inhabitant to intimately move amongst the visceral immediacy of spatial ornament. The tactile personality of form, its articulated surface, combats the cold uniformity of standardization. And uh, here it goes. Here it comes, the project. Uh, done by students under his direction at Yale University. No, at Harvard, sorry, but he teaches at Yale. He's invited at Harvard too. They are exploring architectures that maybe sooner or later will come into being. It's interesting in a way his his approach to architecture because I somehow I see it some at, at the intersection uh, between uh, postmodernism and deconstructivism. The fragmentation is there, but there are also historical, uh, there is a historical or historicist sensibility and monumentality. And this fragmentation coupled with the sense of history uh, creates this architecture, which uh, referring to Patrick Schumacher could be interesting in the sense that Patrick Schumacher thought that postmodernism and deconstructivism were too, um, um, you know, uh, uh, sub-styles, or I don't know how to call them, uh, between modernism and parametricism. And here is an architect who tries, not that he tries, he actually succeeds in, in bringing them somehow together, because uh, chronologically deconstructivism replaced postmodernism in architecture. But here we see an attempt somehow to bring them together in some form. Harvard University, students there under the guidance of Mark Poster Gage. It's, you know, it's an informed cave. It's a cave architecture, it's the cave revival in this particular uh, uh, kind of architecture that. Uh, there are also some references, strangely, you know, uh, because there is also a certain uh, play on uh, uh, even the digital, you know, but uh, as opposed to digital, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, used uh, primary colors and uh, there was a sense of optimistic, uh, uh, you know, democratic uh, architecture here. We see a heavy architecture uh, and uh, we see the different kind of materials used, not so much color, certainly not uh, primary colors. So, but it would be interesting perhaps to compare, let's say a proposal by Theo van Dersburg with this proposal by the students of uh, Mark Foster Gage. Now, a residential tower, West 57th Street, I, I began the presentation with this uh, uh, with this work, an image of this work. Here we see the, the proposal by Mark Foster Gage on the left. <laughs> you certainly would not expect that this is a residential tower. But that's how we, it is called. West 57th Street Residential Tower. And in this picture now on the right is Empire State Building and on the left uh, the proposal by Mark Foster Gage, his most dramatic, the most re the most rhetorical building he, he he envisioned. I mean, look at those balconies. You know, they are huge. I mean, you know, three human silhouettes. They are almost lost in the well. Anyway, they are not lost, but there is plenty of space there for maybe 
200 people or at least 150 or so. This is the tower. Is it a modern tower in the common sense of the world? Well, if the other towers that we see around or the other taller buildings that we see around are modern, then this building is not quite modern, but but, but it is made by uh, our contemporary, Mark, Mark Foster Gage. Uh, what about these giant uh, adornments of the building? You know, these uh, giant ornaments, because that's what they are. How come? How come 100 years after the passionate uh, outbursts of uh, Lo Adolf Loos against ornament, here we are, where a still young architect in the United States proposes something like this. And I'm sure he read uh, Adolf Loos. But since we are fascinated by, you know, King Charles and Prince Charles and Princess Diana, and that is monarchy, while we live comfortably in what we call a democracy, why not also envision, uh, you know, this kind of architecture, uh, you know, uh, at the peak of our, uh, you know, uh, steel and glass uh, democracy. This is the top of the building, the residential tower on 57th Street. I mean, what is happening? I mean, the scale is uh, tremendous. I mean, look at the people there, you know, they, they are small. They are like little ants in that giant space at the top of the, of, of the tower. What kind of, what triggered in this man this kind of vision? Is it just a reaction towards uh, everything that is being built and everything that's being said and done these days? Thank you.